This is Dr. Lauren Lownan, and you're learning microbiology with Dr. L. This um, mini lecture is going to focus on explaining to you an idea that I think of as mini mud. And in other words, the ideas here are microbes are multitudinous, microbes are ubiquitous, microbes are diverse. And being mini is great. And so you can tie that all together into um, a quick little saying and think about mini mud for the purpose of this lecture. So let's talk about the multitudinous part first. In other words, microbes are many. And here are a couple of estimates of the microbial numbers on Earth. Um, as you might imagine, it's really tough to count things that you can't see easily. So these are estimates and people love to argue about them and provide different estimates. So this gets revisited every few years in the microbiology literature and dialogue. But um, in 2012, there was a good paper that came out in PNAS um, by Kallmeyer and um, associates or colleagues and they estimated that there are on the order of magnitude of 10 to the 29 microbes on the planet. So imagine a one with 29 zeros after that, and you are getting the idea here that we're talking about one heck of a lot of microbes on the planet. We also know that there are millions or perhaps hundreds of millions of different species of microbes, and we love even more than we like to argue about the numbers of total microbes is arguing about what a microbial species actually is and how therefore we should describe them and then count them. So embarrassingly enough, we still don't really know how many microbes are on planet Earth. Another set of numbers that I'd like to provide you with, um, and these have also been um, argued in the literature over the last few years, but Right now we know that on a so-called average human, so um, this data was based around a 70 kilogram, uh, about two meter tall adult male human. So actually bigger than what most humans on the earth are. Um, but nonetheless, for example, this, this works on a typical human being, you would have on the order of magnitude of 30 trillion, which is 30 times 10 to the 12 or 1 with 12 zeros after it, human cells. And you'd actually have slightly more microbial cells, so 39 trillion microbial cells. So a roughly 1 to 1 ratio. So I want you to think about that when you look in the mirror next, because when you look at yourself, you're looking at you, the human being, but you, you, are, you are what's called a holobiont or a symbiont, and so am I, and so is any multicellular life form, in that we're made up of human cells, yes, but on and within our cells, we have many, many, many different microbes lining our guts, in our armpits, on the drier areas of our skin, in our mouths, in our genitalia, between our toes, between our fingers, different ones on the right hand than on the left hand, uh, on our scalp, and so on. So, and especially in the GI tract, I would point out. So we are literally houses or homes for microbes, and our biology affects their biology, and their biology affects our biology. The most extreme example of that, of course, being when we are infected with a pathogenic microbe, or when a microbe normally found on our body gets a little bit out of control and stops acting in a normal healthy way and it starts attacking us and that's infection um, and when we have infections we're most certainly witnessing the adverse side of a human microbe relationship um, but we're also living with microbes that are doing beneficial things for example they're helping us to digest our food and they're doing a lot of other things that we're just starting to understand so we influence them they influence us. They influence our mood, our digestive functions, our immune functions, and more. But we are symbiotic or holobiont organisms for sure. And there are many, many microbes living on and within us. So they are multitude on and within the human body, not just on planet Earth overall. I don't know how many viruses are on a so-called typical human. 
So we think about the viruses that come along from time to time and they make us sick. Right now I'm thinking a lot about SARS-CoV-2, the currently circulating pandemic coronavirus, and that virus I'm really hoping does not become associated with my own body or with your bodies. Um, I really hope that doesn't happen. But I also know that there are viruses constantly living on and in my body associated with my own human cells. For example, at my age, I have chickenpox virus, and it is part, I had chickenpox as a child, and it is now part of my microbiome. It normally lives in me without making me sick, but as I get to be an older adult, it can manifest again in the form of shingles. So that's a virus that I know that I have in my own microbiome, and there are many other viruses that I am unaware of and perhaps many that have yet to be discovered. So many, many microbes associated with the human body, whether we're healthy or diseased. So where are the microbes from the point of view of planet Earth? I talked about the human body a moment ago, but let's think, uh, let's zoom back outwards and let's just look at our beautiful planet in our mind's eye and think about the different types of habitats on Earth that can support microbial growth. So we know that a ton of microbes are found in the marine subsurface, so down deep in the oceans, in the sediments, in the area known as the subsurface. That's rich, rich, rich in microbial life. The terrestrial subsurface, so like just below the surface of the Earth, the Earth's crust, about 26% of the total of the mi total you know, microbes known to exist on Earth. So the 66 and 26 are sediment and soil associated microbes. That's an awful lot of microbial matter. In fact, in each teaspoon of garden soil, we probably have more than a thousand different species of microbes present. And if you were to sample from a variety of environments, you could probably in a single semester of work discover something novel that had never been captured before and studied. Um, surface soils in general have around 4.8%, so terrestrial subsurface, I'm going a little bit deeper here. The surface soil is just the top one centimeter or so, that's about, you know, 4 to 5%. The ocean water overall is a little more arid, but it still has a lot of the world's microbes in it. Warmer waters are going to have more microbes, cooler waters are going to have fewer, but all oceans have microbes within them. And then we've got about 1% in quote unquote all other habitats. So that could be on and within you and I as human animals. It's also within the guts of say these termites here. So these termites contain a rich gut community, which is what actually lets the termites digest cellulose and wood. So when a termite uh, colony infects any any wooded material like your house, right, which we don't like them to do. We think it's the termites eating the wood, but the termites just mechanically chew up the wood and swallow it. It's the microbes down in the guts of the termites that actually break down all of that cellulose within wood and allow the termite to get energy from it. So it's a symbiotic relationship between microbe and termite that lets them be wood eaters. So microbes are found in a lot of different habitats. Almost every conceivable habitat on Earth has microbial life. It's, it's, I can't actually think of an example of one that is sterile or completely lacking in microbial life. I can't even think of a single one. So if we go down to Antarctica, these penguins as animals are coated with microbes and within their guts they have microbes. The snow surface or the glacial surface is also rich in microbial life. There will be uh, different bacteria here that are using the sun's energy, using light energy through photosynthesis, and they're perfectly able to grow at the incredibly cold temperatures that they experience, negative 80 Celsius at some points in time, and they can actually grow in that. That's many, many times below the freezing point of water. And then these cold waters all around here also have microbes within them. We used to think Antarctica was sterile not so many decades ago, and now we know that it actually has many different microbes um, in all the various habitats found there. If we deep dive into the oceans and we find areas on the ocean floor where the um, plates of the earth meet, so where there is geologic activity, and because of that magma, heated magma in the subsurface, 
will heat up in those cracks, right? It will heat up water and that causes chemical reactions that make this look like, um, like smoke coming out of a chimney. And in fact, these are called deep smokers or, or blue smokers according to the colors of the chemicals in the water. There's no light down here. And these are many, many meters down below um, the surface of the sea. So they're highly pressurized environments boiling hot in here, pretty cold further away. So a diversity of temperatures, a diversity of chemicals, no lights whatsoever, no light whatsoever. And yet we have teeming communities, many, many microbes in these environments. So essentially all these different habitats, this, an animal um, could never live like right within this, right? Too hot, too pressurized, but there are many microbes that live there and they actually support communities of animal life further out where the temperature gets a little bit more tolerable of, of specialized fish, for example, that have adapted to these environments. And the, and the root of the community from an energy perspective is microbial life using chemicals for energy rather than the sun. Very interesting places. So in short, it's a microbial world. Anywhere you go on the planet, you are going to find microbes. You're going to find all sorts of different habitats, some within millimeters of one another, and you're going to find many different kinds of microbes, fewer in some areas, more in others, but microbes occupy every conceivable habitat on the planet. So it's a microbial world. Another way of saying that is we could say that microbes are ubiquitous. They're found everywhere. So how do you get like so many microbes in so many places? You know, how can they outnumber um, plants and animals to such a degree, right? In terms of sheer numbers and also, by the way, in terms of mass, if you were to weigh all the microbes and weigh all the plants plus animals, you'd have more mass associated with the microbes. Well, one of the big things to remember about microbes, and I said big and I'm sticking my I'm thinking that was kind of a poor choice of words here, but one of the important things is that they are tiny. Remember the definition of a microbe, an organism too small to be seen with the naked eye. And so let's just think of organisms as being cube shaped. If, if animals were cubes, right? Or if microbes were cubes. So if you have a tiny cube versus a larger cube, you might think, you might be inclined to think that it's great to be big, but actually that's not true from an evolutionary and energetic point of view. It's actually, there are huge advantages to being tiny. So if we think about this, let's just think about some really rudimentary math here, okay? Some rudimentary geometry. Let's think about surface area and let's think about volume. So the surface area of any given cube could be calculated by measuring its height, multiplying that by its width, and then multiplying by the number of sides. The volume of any particular cube can be calculated by multiplying the length times the width times the depth. Surface area would be expressed in some sort of unit squared, volume in some sort of unit cubed. I don't care what units you use, the author for this figure used millimeters. So if we compare the left cube and the right cube and we do the math, right, as shown here, we can see that the surface area relative to volume for the little cube is six to one. And the surface area to the volume ratio for the big cube is 24 to eight, which simplifies to three to one. So this has a pretty big, the, t the tiny cube has a pretty big surface area to volume. The big cube has a pretty small, relatively speaking, surface area to volume. And that turns out to be really important for living things because for all living things, you've got this, you've got this fundamental need. You've got to get nutrients into the living thing, like sugar in our case as humans, right? Food. And you've got to get waste out of the living thing. So we have to get, for example, CO2 out of our bodies by exhalation. And we have to pass feces and pass urine and that gets waste products out of our body. We take food and water in, we get waste materials out. Microbes are no different. They have to get nutrients in, 
they have to get waste out, but they're doing it across just their cell surface, right? Unlike us. So the thing is, is that there is an optimal surface area to volume for this kind of exchange. And as organisms get bigger and bigger, you've got demand, but you don't have enough room in the surface to move nutrients and wastes across the surface of those organisms. This ultimately limits metabolism. So as cells get bigger, or as organisms get bigger, their metabolism gets more and more limited, and that slows growth down. And the slower an any given type of organism can grow, the fewer of those organisms you can have in any given habitat. And what that means is less opportunity for evolution to act. It will still act on the slow things, but you will see change happening slowly, more slowly, per unit evolutionary time, right? So a, in a year, a group of microbes can evolve a lot more genetic change than a group of larger organisms like humans, right? Because the microbes that are little are able to move nutrients and waste across much faster, do faster metabolism, grow faster, and therefore change faster. And we're gonna see more change per unit evolutionary time. From a biological point of view, that is a winning strategy. So it turns out that tiny cells have an advantage over larger cells, and tiny organisms have an advantage over larger organisms. And this is one of the things that gives microbes the upper hand on the planet, and also, unfortunately, as you'll be learning in this course, sometimes within our human body. They grow really, really quickly, so they can take over really quickly. And if they're harmful, then that can be a big problem for the human host. And we'll be learning about that in this course. But I want to give you a simpler example right now of the sorts of side effects of having rapid growth because you're little. And I'm going to focus in on oxygen preference or oxygen tolerance, both things, right? How, does how do living creatures interact with oxygen? So if you were to look over, these are supposed to be test tubes of something that's very much like chicken soup, and the dots or cloudy areas are microbial growth, and one through five are different types of microbes that are showing very different patterns of growth in these test tubes. Now, to understand this picture, you have to understand that the oxygen can only get in from the top. So this is oxygen-rich air up here, and this is liquid down here. Oxygen's not super soluble in watery matrices. So oxygen is going to diffuse in from the top. So in these test tubes, if you leave them sitting still, you will have a lot of oxygen up at the top and hardly any oxygen down at the bottom. And there will be this gradation as you go through the tube. So these organisms, organism number one, loves and needs oxygen. It's growing right up at the surface. In contrast, organism number two absolutely hates oxygen. It is growing at the very bottom of the tube where there is limited to no oxygen and none of that organism is growing up here. This is an aerobe or strict aerobe. This is an anaerobe, strict, uh, strictly preferring to not have oxygen. And then these guys don't care so much, and they have other names that I won't get into here, okay? But this kind of preference for oxygen is something that we just don't see in plants and animals. You know, humans, for example, if you were to put us in an environment like the bottom of this test tube, we would just die because we very much and always need oxygen. But you'd be surprised to know that there are many, many different microbes on the earth that love environments that have no oxygen. And in fact, even on your human body, we have a ton of habitat within the human body that lacks oxygen. In our mouths, down between our teeth, there are a lot of anaerobic habitats where we'll get these kinds of critters growing. And deep down in our guts, in the colon, there's essentially no oxygen whatsoever in the fecal material as it's passing through the colon. And that fecal material is full of microbes. And so we have all kinds of anaerobic microbes in the colon that, that, that find that they're, that's their preferred or uh, evolved to have habitat. And they're all anaerobic. 
This is an example of metabolic diversity, the fact that you can have many different kinds of microbes with a variety of oxygen preference. And you only get that kind of metabolic diversity in, in the microbes. They're really remarkable when it comes to metabolic diversity. This is just one example of, of thousands of potential examples that I'm sharing with you. And the take home message here, tiny cells have an advantage over larger cells. Microbes have an advantage over multicellular life forms because of the size difference. And because of that, microbes have evolved to be incredibly metabolically diverse. In other words, there are many different species of microbes that are able to grow in almost any different habitat on the planet. So in conclusion, remember the mini mud thing, okay? It's great to be tiny, and I just talked about why, right? And then remember the mud thing. I don't have this quite stacked up in the right uh, area, but they are many or multitudinous, they are everywhere or they are ubiquitous, and they are diverse, right? They can do a lot of different kinds of things. Almost anything that you can imagine, there's a microbe out there that can do that. And that concludes this mini lecture. Thanks for listening.